this is into the fire. What a massive pleasure it is to welcome South Aussie's own, the elite athlete, swim superstar, and all around great bloke, Kyle Chalmers. Nice to meet you, Kyle. Hey, mate. Thanks very much for having me on. I feel very privileged to be on the show. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Before we start, just a huge congratulations on Nationals, mate. 50 metre, 100 and 200 metre wins. Looking good. Yeah, it was. It was a good good week in the pool. So a um, bit of a shock to the system for me. I haven't raced uh, in almost 12 months because I had shoulder surgery in December. So um, working my way back in and it was my first, I guess, biggish competition since shoulder surgery. So it's good for my mind that I'm still able to swim fast. Yeah, outstanding performance. You grew up in Port Lincoln, which is a fair way from Adelaide. You were so talented that you your family moved to your swimming. I bet you're appreciative of all your family support. Do you get back to Port Lincoln ever? Maybe for a bit of a tuna tossing? <laughs> I do actually get back. To, I, I um The week before Nationals, I decided that it would be a good opportunity. It was a long weekend. I thought it would be a great chance for me to get home and see my my grandparents who are getting a lot older now, so it's harder for them to get over as much as I'd like to see them. And then uh, all my cousins and friends are still there. So uh, I went home for three nights, which was big for me. And then I got a couple of days off training, which was a real treat and um, went back to where I grew up. So I, I loved going, I loved my time back there, did a bit of fishing, just unwound a little bit. But um, like you said, I'm very, very grateful that my parents made the decision for me to come across to Adelaide. Um, it was more so based around education, to be honest with you, obviously school and um, getting that year 12 certificate is such an important thing. And uh, my dad was a, an elite athlete. He played AFL for Port, Port Power and the Crows. And um, he has always installed in me from a young, young age that education comes first um, because you need to have that fallback plan. But if sport, you know, if I, if I hurt my shoulder and I'm, I'm unable to swim, I need to have something to fall back on. So um I've, I've learned that from a young age but i've um yeah it's been it's been a good journey across to adelaide and i love it here now i consider it home but eventually i'll move back to port lincoln i think yeah both of them are great places you played footy like your dad up until 15 when you broke your wrist and tore ankle ligaments did you give up because you felt after that you needed to concentrate just on swimming how good were you at footy come on don't be humble <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I had made the Australian swimming team that year. I went across to Sydney and, uh, and raced at the, and the national championships, which was the, the world championship qualifiers that year. So, um, I, I made the swimming team, which was a bit of a unexpected surprise for me, but, um, for me, my main focus was footy. I love playing footy. I wanted to play, um, just like my dad did play at the elite level, obviously in the AFL and, um. I guess I started footy as a four-year-old kid in the Oz kick over, over home in Port Lincoln and had always focused on my footy. And I came back from that World Championships trials and um, played a couple of games of footy. And the first one I played second 18s for my school. And then uh, the week after I got the call up to the first 18s, which my, my dad was coaching at the time. And uh, I went into the ruck and first quarter, I went out for a ruck contest and kind of fell down on my wrist and cracked the bone in my wrist. And... Um, got that strapped up, ran back out there. And it wasn't until the last quarter that I actually did the ligaments in my ankle. And I remember going into training the next day and obviously my ankle was very swollen and sore, but my wrist was the sorest. So I decided that I'd just do kick. I couldn't, I couldn't swim with my arms. So I just did kick and my ankle just got worse and worse and worse until um, I ended up getting a, a cortisone into my ankle just to kind of numb the pain so I could swim at the world champs. But um, my the coaches and um, support staff from Swimming Australia kind of said, you've got to make the decision now, um, whether you want to swim or whether you want to play footy. And for me, as a 15 year old, I was going to earn some money being on the Australian Australian swimming team. So I thought I'll go get the money and I'll swim for Australia. And um, I'm very happy with my decision now. But um, footy is something I love. It's something I still love uh, and something I still dream of one day being able to do. I think. Uh, I'm good mates with Sam Jacobs, who lives just around the corner. He's gone back to play country footy in Ardrossan. So I think uh, once my swimming career is done, I'll probably lace the boots up back down in, in Ardrossan with him for a few seasons. But um, yeah, that's, I think, as far as it'll get me these days, mate. It would be cool to see you playing some footy, but I'm glad you chose swimming. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it would be very cool. And it would be cool just to... 
do it just like my dad. I think that's probably the biggest draw factor is um, following your dad's footsteps. Yeah. Your dad was a great footballer. 75 games for the Crows and Port. What was it like following dad around as a young fella? And do you have a club you barrack for? Yeah, so dad, obviously, um, growing up over in the country, he grew up just outside of Port Lincoln in a town called Cleve. Um, so when he retired from the AFL and moved back over there, I guess he was pretty famous in a small town and people used to come up and ask him for signatures and photos. And and I thought my dad was a rock star. So um, that, that was really cool being able to follow him around. And, you know, I love kicking the footy. I love playing footy, but there's nothing better than, I guess, going and having a kick of footy with your dad. So um, for me growing up, that was probably my, my highlights was when dad would be like, do you want to go have a kick of footy or... Um, and we'd go out into the driveway and have a kick or go down to the goals and have a shot at goal, which was, which is some of my, some of my fondest memories growing up, I guess. And, um, yeah, so that was cool. And then obviously me now, I, I was a big Essendon supporter growing up, actually over in Port Lincoln, my best mate was a, an Essendon supporter. So I thought I'll be an Essendon supporter as well, because I couldn't choose between the Crows and the power because dad played for both. Um, and it wasn't until we moved back over to Adelaide and dad's a life member of the power. He said that if you want to come to the games with me, you have to support the power. So um, it was a pretty simple decision. I went, I want to go watch live footy. So I'll be a Port Adelaide supporter. And now I'm an ambassador of the club. So um, I try to get to as many games as I can. And, I, and I've got quite a number of, of mates at the club um, that I keep in touch with. So uh, I, I really enjoy being involved in, in that, um, I guess, professional environment in Adelaide. Reckon you might have chose the wrong club there, but... Who's your team? Crows. Mm. Come on, mate. I reckon we'll do a right against you guys this year in the showdown again. Yeah, me too, sadly. I reckon you might have chose the wrong team. <laughs> Maybe. Now, you've always been set for stardom, so much so that articles were written on you that you would be bigger than Nick Curios and Daniel Riccardi. How do you handle that pressure? Is it something that gets to gets to you ever? It's something that I don't tend to read into, to be honest with you. Um, I think, you know, there's always going to be articles that are written uh, and the media are all what you're never as good as the media say you are and you're never as bad as the media say you are. So it's something that I try not to read into um, because it is a distraction from the pool because they can write whatever they, they want. They could watch this YouTube video and take one line that I've said and, and put it into a, into a big storyline. Um, and I guess it definitely can put pressure on you and stress you out. But for me, uh, it's not beneficial for my, myself or my swimming career. So I tend to not read um, articles unless they're really positive and I need a bit of a pick me up before I race, then I might look over it. But, um, but yeah, it's, there is a lot of pressure, uh, especially coming into the Olympic games now um, as the, as the reigning champion, um, there's, there's definitely some pressure on me, but uh, I just need to focus on what I can do and what I can control. Everyone has a, in my sport, everyone has a lane, everyone has a diving block. So everyone has the same opportunity to win. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm just as good a chance as, as anyone else is. If you were standing in the block next to me, you, you probably could, could beat me on my day. I uh, don't think so, but. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you're a superstar and huge all around the world. So how does someone so good stay so, hum so humble? Uh, for me, I like to remember where I've come from. So I'm a, I'm a country boy from Port Lincoln. Um, my friends and my family and my hobbies are the most important thing to me. And I don't like to think of myself as, as Kyle Chalmers, the swimmer, because there's there's so much more to me than, that, than just being a swimmer or known as the swimmer. So, um, you know, swimming for me is pretty much a job now. Uh, so I'm able to you know, do so many other things in my in my days that fill in the time and allow me to stay grounded. Um, but yeah, I guess it, I guess it's just staying connected with with the friends and family that I have um, who have been with me my entire life, and they keep me definitely down to earth for sure. When did you first go to yourself? I want to swim in the Olympics. And was there a time you remember when you thought you actually could? Um. It's a hard one. I think for me, I, I never grew up watching swimming or supporting swimming or, or the Olympics. I remember um, I, I kind of fell into swimming because I was one of very few people in Port Lincoln in my age group that could swim 50 metres. So I came to Adelaide to represent um, the Lower Air Peninsula at Sapsaza and 
Uh, I never really thought about representing Australia from there. It was just an opportunity for me to stay fit while I was playing footy. Obviously, footy was winter and then I could swim through the summer and I'd stay fit and come into footy season pretty good. Um, but it wasn't probably till 2015 when I um, made that World Championships team to go to Kazan in Russia that I thought I want to actually go to the Olympic Games and, and represent my country at the Olympics. So what, that's when my mindset kind of flicked from being wanting to be an AFL footballer to wanting to be an Olympic swimmer. And uh, as soon as I made that switch, I did everything in my power to make my dream reality. So um, I, I started training a whole lot more and doing gym and eating the good foods that I needed to do and uh, making sure I was napping during the day and, 2016 was not only my um, Olympic year, but it was also my year 12 at school. So I had to find a way where I could be at school as minimal as possible. So I did my year 12 online in 2016 because I knew that I was going to be pretty well away for the entire year overseas. So um, there was plenty of things that I did to make sure that my dream became a reality. And um, But yeah, it wasn't until then, I guess, that I really wanted to be an Olympic Olympic swimmer, I think. I represented Australia from 2012 uh, as, a, as a junior athlete on junior teams, but I never thought that I'd actually make it to the, the senior dogs because I thought that, um, that that wasn't for me. But I'm definitely very glad, like I said, that I've, I've made that decision. And, um, you know, my dream now is to go to a second Olympics, uh, hopefully this year in Tokyo. Hopefully. Now, you were destined to be great, but as an 18-year-old, you burst on the scene winning the greatest event in swimming, the 100 metre freestyle and an Olympic gold medal. Wow, sounds cool. Just saying it, doesn't it? Can you even get close to describing that feeling as you touched the wall and knew you were, you were an Olympic gold medal winner? No, I can't. And I think it's a, a feeling I've worked so hard every day for now for the last five years to have again. It was obviously such a fractional um, time where you can kind of touch the wall, look up and see the number one next to your name uh, and have that really quick feeling of how, how exciting it is. Um, for me, it was kind of a, a bit of a different feeling as well because my great mate Cameron McAvoy was in the race and um, we'd trained together and I, I was being coached by his coach at the Olympics. Um, and I looked and saw my name first and then saw that Cam hadn't done as well as we'd both hoped. So I kind of um, was a bit upset for him. So I was a bit of a, bittersweet moment really for me so uh, my my first instinct was kind of to support cam and um cam came under and, and under the lane rope and, and got around me and i remember him lifting my arm up in the air and, and that was probably my fondest moment um of of that little period so but yeah I'm, I'm definitely working hard to do that again it's it's the blue ribbon event like you said the people the the event that people want to watch. So um, I'm very lucky to be uh, not uh, not only a swimmer, but a 100 metre freestyler for sure. Yeah, it was amazing to watch. Now, all through your life, you had heart problems, which I'm sure has caused you some concern. Having three heart surgeries, you had an elevated heart rate condition that can cause chest pain and fainting, scary stuff. How is that now? Did they fix after your latest surgery? And was there a time where you seriously thought it could end your career at its peak? Yeah, so it is all fixed now, which is which is fantastic. So the first, so what I had was a condition called superventricular tachycardia. Right. So um, SVT for short, which was good. But um, so yeah, I had my first surgery in 2015. Um, essentially, what it was was I had an extra circuit in my heart that the blood could get into, and then it wouldn't be able to get out, so it would just keep going around and around and around. So they what they their plan was to go in, burn that circuit. And then the blood wouldn't be able to get inside of there. So um, the first time I had the surgery, I was young. I was pretty nervous. So I decided I'd go under anesthetic for it. And they couldn't get enough adrenaline in my heart. So I couldn't, um, they couldn't get the problem to happen. And then the second time, 2017, I'd been having a few more problems. Um, and they decided, let's get this thing fixed for good now. So I wasn't able to go under anesthetic. So I was awake for the surgery, which was pretty daunting, obviously. Um, then working on my heart while I was awake. But they put a burn in the circuit. Uh, it was pretty good for a while. And then it started to play up again um, quite a lot around 2019. So um had the surgery for a third time and they completely took the circuit out and it's been really good since so 
Um, I've, I've met quite a few people, obviously, with that same condition um, since the surgery. And uh, it seems to be that lots of people take multiple attempts to, to get it right. So um, I'm glad that it's, it's all resolved now and it's something I no longer have to worry about, obviously, when I'm standing behind the blocks on race day. But um, I don't think there was really a point that I thought that it would end my career. Obviously, it was, it was pretty scary, but it's something that I'd lived with for such a long time that I thought, hey, I'd be able to just continue to live with it. Obviously, I was pretty stressed that if I dove in for a race and it happened when I was, you know, in an in Olympic final, I'd have to stop and get out um, or I could probably drown um, because obviously I'd be, I'd be blacked out, so I'd go to the bottom of the pool. But um, So that was probably my biggest concern. And then, you know, there's a small chance that the surgery goes wrong and I could end up with a, with a pacemaker, which would have obviously ruined my career um, straight away. But... Uh, I got I got very lucky with it, and and I'm I'm grateful that I was had great doctors who knew what they were doing and and able to resolve the problem for me pretty quickly. Yeah, it's it's great that it's over, but it would have been a scary time. Yeah, for sure it was. It was definitely scary, especially being a main organ that you rely on so heavily. Yeah, I saw the pool in your backyard during COVID. It was pretty cool. That's commitment to getting the best out of yourself. Although using a bathtub may have been a bit difficult. <laughs> bathtub could have worked. I didn't think of that, actually. Um, the pool's been very handy for me. I think we were when we initially went into the lockdown and the Olympics were cancelled, um, my, my coach called me and said, hey, how about you decide to try and get a pool in your backyard that you, you can swim against? Um, so essentially it's, a swimming, it's like a treadmill swimming so you kind of swim against these big jets um and it pushes you back so and you can set the speed that you want to swim at so uh when when we first went into lockdown they told us we were going to be out of the water for potentially six months so for me that i've never swam i've never been out of the water since i was nine years old for that amount of time so i was kind of a bit worried and trying to find a way that i could um get through I guess so getting that pool into the backyard was was really beneficial for me so I could just get in and swim and um, do what I love to do. Yeah now the Tokyo Olympics were put off a year what does that do to an athlete who has prepared themselves for that day and knowing they have to prepare all over again? I guess it depends on on the athlete really for me it played into my favor because my shoulder was really, really bad last year. And I know that if the Tokyo Olympics went ahead last year, I wouldn't have been there swimming because my, my shoulder was um, needing surgery. So um, I had the surgery and I'm, I'm back swimming fast again now. So it's been kind of a relief that it got pushed back a year for me, but uh, there's definitely people that it's affected um, quite a lot who have been forced into retirement because they were, they were getting a bit older and another year meant, was just too long for them uh and yeah so but then, then there's a lot of younger kids who are starting to come onto the scene now who wouldn't have been able to make the olympics last year because they were a bit too young or a little bit too slow and an extra year of training's really helped them out so um it's definitely depend different for each athlete uh but, but for me it's been it's been a blessing yeah now your rivalry with caleb dressel is fascinating it's almost movie like with both of you at different times getting the upper hand over each other. You obviously have a great friendship with him. Does this competitive rivalry you have you have drive you? Because I'm sure you guys will keep an eye on each other. It definitely does drive me. It's something that I need to stay motivated. I need to have someone that I can chase. But we are great friends. We stay in touch. Uh, he got married recently and, and we, we, chat about, we chat about lots of things. Um, but, you know, the, I think there's two different types of athletes, really. There's some people that learn to absolutely hate their competitors and hate their rivals, and it gives them that motivation in training and racing so they, they want nothing more than to beat that person. But for me, I'd rather have friends that I can talk to in the marshalling room and, um, you know, celebrate their achievements just as much as I can celebrate mine. So um, we've had some great races over the years. Uh, I beat him in 2016, I beat him in 2018, and then he beat me in 2019. So it's 2-1 my way, which is good um, at the big competition. So hopefully we can make it 3-1 this year and, um, and get the big one over him. But uh, as long as I can put, put together my best performance, I'm going to be happy. It's like yeah. at, at the World Championships in 2019, I swam the fastest I've ever swam by 
0.3 of a second, which is quite a lot in swimming. And he just happened to be that tiny little bit faster. He was only 0.06 of a second ahead of me. Um, but so I was, I was happy. Like, I, I can't be upset with that. And, and I um, celebrated, celebrated his win with him. Yeah, it's good that you celebrate with him, but let's hope we make it 3-1. Exactly. Let's hope so. Yeah. Okay, some quick questions. Do you think you'll ever play AFL again? No, I don't think I don't think so, but I have actually met with some AFL clubs about potentially being a, a category B rookie if I decide to no longer be a swimmer. So um, there's definitely a possibility there, but I think for me, um, I'm getting older now. I'm I'm 23 this year, which is not too old, but I mean it's getting old to transition into another sport. So I think I'd rather stick with swimming and, and see how far I can go and, and what I can achieve in the sport. Yeah. Do you really watch Kevin Durant's speech before every race? Yeah, it's something I um, I do. And I'm a, I'm a huge Kevin Durant supporter. I've got a Kevin Durant signed jersey. I've got a Kevin Durant signed ball, some shoes. I've got a couple of his rookie basketball cards. I've got a big painting of Kevin Durant. I'm a huge Kevin Durant fan. So for me, um, that's the motivation that I need before I before I race is to hear his MVP speech and um, big fan. Yeah. How many times has your dad shown his highlights? <laughs> Lots of times, especially as a kid growing up. Um, he's, he's showed me a lot. I don't know whether you've seen it, but he kicked the goal from about 75 metres um, in an in a SNFL grand final. Um, and I've seen that goal hundreds of times, I'd like to say. Yeah. You've just won the Olympic gold medal and swimming is finished. What meal do you go and eat? KFC. Oh, yeah, that would if probably that was be my option, choice. If, yeah, if, I, if that was my option in the Olympic Village, I would go for KFC. I'm a huge KFC fan. Um, but being on such a strict diet, I don't get to eat it as often as I'd like. So when I do... I eat so much of it that I feel sick. So um, if the, if there was a big KFC in the Olympic Village, that's where you'd find me after my race. Yeah, the original burger is my favourite. So the same as me, it's great. Yeah. Can you give me a quick insight into how you're feeling on, on those blocks before an Olympic final? How nervous are you? I'm not a person that gets too nervous. For me, I was just grateful to be a part of the Olympic final. My my goal as an 18-year-old kid, I'd only just turned 18 as well, was to, to make the Olympic final, which meant I was the top eight fastest 100 freestylers in the world. So I remember standing behind the blocks and looking down the end of the pool and, uh, and just smiling because I knew how hard I'd worked to be there. So um, for me, I, I wasn't too nervous. Um, I'd kind of ticked the box that I wanted to do, which was make the final, and I knew that I could just enjoy the experience. So... I think that's why, why I was able to stay um, swim so well because I was able to stay relaxed and, and not get too nervous about it all. Yeah, good answer. Okay, Kyle, now you're a champion and I'm predicting gold medals hanging around that neck again. But after watching the replay of your 100-metre win, I noticed something missing. Seriously, you just won an Olympic gold medal and you sat in the pool after like you were having a spa with friends. You need to show a bit more excitement, Kyle. And I have this celebration for you. It will get all spectators and people off their seats. It's the end of the fire. <laughs> Do you want to have a try with me? Yeah. No. I like it. That's very cool. Nice. That I'll goes on well. <laughs> very good. Maybe we'll catch up for an original recipe KFC right. burger to celebrate when we're done. Yeah, sounds good. I feel That's so good. privileged to have met you today, Kyle. You're the worldwide superstar, but still the nicest guy ever. It's been a pleasure to chat with you, and I can't wait to cheer you on down in the pool in Tokyo. Thanks heaps, Kyle. Thank you so much for having me on, mate. I feel very honoured and privileged to be a part of the show. So all the best with the podcasts, all the videos you got, you're producing, and um, you've got a big future ahead of you. So keep chasing those dreams, and I look forward to seeing the videos come out. Thanks, Kyle. Good luck at Tokyo. Thanks, mate.